Hi everyone, Scott here. Um, I'm recording this on Thursday morning. Um, if I record over on that side of the room, um, light uh, leaks in through the blinds and um, darkens the image, uh, so I've moved myself over here to this corner um, because I just watched a video and I wanted to talk a little bit about it. Um, Mike, uh, who many of you know from YouTube, um, is uh, uh, one of our uh, movie fans uh, who um, uh, talks about uh, the films that he sees and the films that he likes, uh, a lot of uh, classic films of the past, but also contemporary films. Um, he uh, posted his video uh, on Wednesday on uh, the Darren Aronofsky film Mother, um, and uh, I didn't get a chance to watch it before I left for work, um, so I've seen it this morning, just now, uh, and I wanted to talk about that and talk about the film, of course. Um, it's been in theaters for, uh, as of this uh, posting, um, about two weeks. I've gotten a lot of very, very uh, negative uh, attention, a lot of negative uh, feedback. Um, some of this has to do with how the movie is marketed, and um, I made the decision to not watch any of the trailers and previews and not read reviews and not watch people's videos uh, talking about what they thought of the film until after I'd seen it. And I went in knowing not that much about the movie. I knew who the director was, of course, Darren Aronofsky. I've seen all of his films in the theater, actually. I went back and just thought, hey, is there, is there any that I just waited for uh, a video? No, no, I've seen all of them in the theater, actually. Um, under different circumstances, each one, or uh, some of them. Um, I saw The Fountain at a film festival. Um, and I saw Pi as part of like an advanced uh, test screening, kind of, except that they had the wrong lens on the camera, so the image was distorted. I mean, the, uh, the wrong lens on the projector. Um, but I've seen them all in the theater, and some of them I've liked very much, and some of them I didn't. Mike mentioned that he didn't really care for Black Swan, and I really am not a fan of that movie either. Uh, but for the most part, I think he's a very interesting filmmaker. Um, and, um, when I left this movie, uh, this new movie, Mother, I had a pretty enthusiastic reaction to it. Um, there are some films that I've, after I've seen in the theater, I just walk out feeling better. Um, I just, you know, am just super excited and enthused about film itself. Um, some of the, uh, uh examples of this are Seven by David Fincher from 1995, um, American Beauty in 1999, uh, with Kevin Spacey and Annette Bening, uh, and um, um, Inception uh, by Christopher Nolan. You all know about that one, of course. Um, just really excited about about the experience of seeing the movie. Uh, just enthusiastic about wow, what a what a what a great experience that was. And that's exactly how I felt coming out of this new Darren Aronofsky film, Mother. Um, <laughs> Um, so when I got home and started reading reviews for the film and watching videos, people's reaction, I kind of said to myself, wow, I have no taste. <laughs> so many people hate this movie. So many people have problems with this movie or find it to be a, uh, a screamingly obvious metaphor and pretentious. Pretentious is a word that's often used in regards to this movie. And I really have to question whether or not people who are calling that understand what the word pretentious means. Pretentious comes from, you know, the root word pretense, which is about um, uh, 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 putting on airs, I guess, uh, uh, pretending to be something that you're not. I mean, it's pretending, really. It's pretending something. Um, and pretentious is often used in a way to describe how the creator of whatever you know, is being called pretentious, their um, reach is exceeding their grasp, meaning they are striving for something and not able to reach it because of lack of talent, or because of bad decisions, or they want <laughs> to say something in particular and present it in a particular way and they just fall flat on their face, or they shouldn't be doing it in the first place. That's another impression that I get from people who call a movie pretentious. Now, Mike didn't call it pretentious. I'm not talking about him in particular, um, but uh, a lot of people have, and a couple people that I really admire on YouTube, aside from Mike, are Jim Gisriel and um, 
um, a lady named, I think her name is Molly. She doesn't really use her, her real name on her videos. Her channel is called Deep Focus Lens. They're both very smart, very knowledgeable about film, and they both reacted to this movie very negatively. And I'm thinking, wow, what is wrong with me that I like this movie so much? Um, before I got home and started looking at everyone's opinions, I was thinking about the movie as I left and wondering what it all meant. There was a point during the movie where I realized that I wasn't supposed to be taking what's happening literally on screen. Things that are happening that, um, that, 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 that's, that mean something. It's, it's, it's a metaphor for something. It's an allegory for something. And it wasn't until afterwards that I realized what that was. And it was the two brothers that clued me in. Um, there's a, a, a couple of young men who are brothers who show up uh, a part way into the movie. One of them is very, very angry about the way that um, he's being treated. Uh, he's very angry because he figures his brother is getting favorable treatment, and in a fit of rage and jealousy, he picks up a heavy object and hits him in the head and kills him. And it just struck me suddenly, oh, wait a minute, that's what happened with Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel is a Bible story, of course, about the first children of Adam and Eve, but if they're Cain and Abel, does that make their parent characters in the movie Adam and Eve? Then I start making all these other associations and slowly begin to slowly put together the fact that the movie, most of what happens in the movie is allegorical referencing, allegorically referencing Bible stories. I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then I get home and I start watching YouTube videos and they're like, yeah, the Bible th stuff, that was just like, so screamingly obvious, you know, it made me ill or, or just made me angry. I'm like, darn it, you know, man, I am not smart at all for not catching that while the movie was actually playing. <laughs> uh, um, so, if you're not, uh, like I said, I didn't really go into this movie um, knowing a lot about it, um, other than who was in it and the basic setting, I guess you could say, um, and, and, of course, the director. And a lot of people are complaining about the marketing of the movie and how it's being sold as a horror movie. And that, I think, is a problem. <laughs> um, but that's not really on the um, director. I don't know how much um, Aronofsky had to do with the marketing of the movie the way they wanted to sell it. Um, you know, obviously, I think um, the studio wanted to make sure that people, um, you know, were interested in seeing the movie, so they didn't sell it as an art movie. Um, that's what how Jim Grisrell describes the movie. He calls it an auteur statement, rather than, you know, just an entertainment movie, an exploitation movie, which is what a lot of horror movies usually are, but I would never call it a horror movie. Um, to me, it's closer to a David Lynch movie, where there's this sort of dream logic applied to what happens, and you could not take it literally, you could take it as entirely symbolic, or you could take it as a story in which extraordinarily odd things happen in the context of this world, such as, say, Lost Highway, for example. Lost Highway has some very inexplicable things happening, but it's not treated as a dream, and it's not treated as uh, uh, some sort of science fiction or fantasy story. It's just a world where strange, inexplicable things happen that sort of defy nature in a way. Now, nothing in, you know, there's there's bits in this movie that defy nature, strictly speaking, uh, particularly in the very beginning and very end of the movie. There's sort of this bookend sequence. The movie begins and ends with very, very similar moments. Um, but for the most part, what happens is realistic, um, in a sense. Of course, then I'm remembering the hole in the floor that starts bleeding for some reason, and, you know, things things just get weird. Things get strange, they get... I, I, I think to myself, okay, there's going to be some sort of explanation for what's happening here at some point in the movie, but it really doesn't come easily. Um, and at a certain point, I thought, okay, whatever's happening here is symbolic of something, and I don't know what that is, but maybe I'll figure it out, or maybe they'll reveal it in the end. Um, and I sort of started to get giddy after a while, because you have a situation where these characters, the, particularly the main character, played by Jennifer Lawrence, is dealing with this problem of all these people at her home who are bothering her and, and disturbing her peace and really sort of tearing the house apart. Um, they come in, they, they want to meet her husband, Javier Bardem, who is this famous writer. Um, they want to praise him. 
Uh, they want to uh, uh, um, show how much they appreciate him, and then they eventually start sort of invading the territory, just like taking things, pulling things off the wall and grabbing them, uh, and saying, we want a piece of this, you know, we want a little piece of, uh, of this person um, that we admire so much and, and, and kind of worship, I guess you could say. If Javier Bardem is, uh, you know, an allegorical character for God, uh, then that certainly would make some sense. Um, and it reminded me of um, the um, Beatles comedy, Robert Zemeckis' early uh, comedy uh, called I Want to Hold Your Hand, in which a whole bunch of characters are just dying to see the Beatles. And one of them actually cuts pieces from the carpet in the hotel where they're staying because they walked across that bit of carpet as they left their hotel room and goes and sells it to people and say, hey, the Beatles touched this. Um, kind of reminded me of that scene, so that was funny. But things just get more and more outrageous and extreme as time goes on. And uh, I started actually finding it quite funny. Um, and I was just giddy about, you know, I was just thinking to myself, wow, this is incredible, what's going to happen next? Two minutes later, wow, that's amazing, what's going to happen next? Um, the setting is this house out in the middle of nowhere, this country house, um, and um, there was a, a reviewer actually pointed out that there's no driveway, <laughs> there's no garage, no driveway, so it's like anywhere you leave, you you have to walk there or something like that. Um, but the house starts getting so crowded and the chaos is getting so great that the riot police show up. And I'm like, where did the riot police come from? They're out in the middle of nowhere. And then eventually I sort of caught into the fact that this is all sort of a metaphor for something. Um, and I shouldn't be taking it literally necessary. Whereas up until that point, I really was. Um, the couple, the main couple, Javier Bardem and Jennifer Lawrence, um, they're, you know, basically living in their house peacefully, quietly. He's working. Uh, she's fixing the place up, taking care of it. Um, and then people start showing up. And Javier Bardem invites them to stay. The first person is Ed Harris, um, who uh, turns out is an admirer of the writer. He comes there under the pretense of, uh, of, uh, of looking for a bed and breakfast to stay in, but in fact he knows who the author is. Um, and then Michelle Pfeiffer's wife shows up the next day, um, and, and they end up staying. Javier Bardem's like, oh, let's let them stay, you know, they're, they're you know, they're, they're, they're being very nice, let's let them stay, and, um, Jennifer Lawrence isn't on board with that exactly. Oh, uh, uh, if I haven't mentioned it all, I haven't mentioned it already, but none of these characters actually refer to each other by name. Um, I really like it when that happens, because I think it's a very, very clever, uh, <laughs> that a writer is able to pull off scenes with credibility without, uh, you know, while avoiding mentioning any names. Uh, it's an interesting trick, um, and uh, I, uh, I didn't uh, notice that until, you know, partway into the movie, that no one, you know, there were no, there were no names being mentioned. There's another film, um, an ensemble drama that's like that, called Your Friends and Neighbors, uh, with Jason Patrick and Catherine Keener and uh, Ben Stiller and a few other uh, people. Um, and although... They talk about each other, and they talk about characters that are off-screen, you know, not part of the scene at any given moment. You always know who they're talking about, even though no names are being mentioned. Um, and it's the same with this one as well. Um, I just find it a very impressive piece of writing that they're able to do that. Um, and I think one of the reasons why none of the characters are named is because you know, you can't name characters like these Adam and Eve, it would just make this, you know, uh, the uh, the uh, symbolism, the metaphor, you know, that much more obvious, even more obvious than apparently it was, although I didn't, you know, uh, I didn't uh, get it right away. There's a moment where Javier Bardem is uh, taking care of Ed Harris, who appears to be sick, he's getting sick in a toilet, and he's got this wound in his side that Javier Bardem tries to hide from Jennifer Lawrence, he covers it so that she won't see it. And thinking back, I'm going, oh, that's where he pulled the rib out, right? So when they went walking out for their walk, Javier Bardem pulled the rib out of Ed Harris to create Eve. Is that how it is? Um, <laughs> um, I can see why people maybe wouldn't like this so much. Um, because most people, they want to be able to take what happens on screen literally and not see it as, you know, a big thing that means something else. Where, um, you know, that can be frustrating for people. But I loved it. And <laughs> when I left the theater, I thought to myself, this makes me want to watch every Aronofsky, Aronofsky movie again, including Black Swan, which I didn't like. I just want to watch them all because I so admire the fact that he made this movie in the first place. 
Um, and that means that uh, I have no taste, I guess, because so many people don't like it. So many people that would think it was a bad idea to make this movie, that Aaron Aronofsky should have just gone into therapy or something like that, because this is like him working out his own issues with being admired as an artist, or the women in his life. Um, I've read a lot of stuff about, you know, his personal life, uh, unfortunately. In fact, Darren Aronofsky is like the uh, um, the subject of one of the one of my favorite unconfirmed uh, sleazy rumors about Hollywood, um, but I won't get into that because um, it's like I said, it's unconfirmed. I have no idea if it's it's really true or not. Um, but uh, if it is, it's 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 quite salacious. Anyway, um, <laughs> so so people you know think that Darren Aronofsky should have made this movie. You know they should have spent all this money on it. You know and put all get up and gotten all these people to work on it and then. Paramount, the studio should not have marketed and put in a bunch of theaters and called it like a thriller or horror movie, whatever it is that they're calling it, because it's just misleading people. And I denied myself the opportunity to be misled. I went in knowing not what this movie was supposed to be or what they what uh, uh, what what people that produced the movie wanted me to think that it was before I went to see it. I just went in and took it as it was. And I think that was very helpful in me enjoying the experience, because if I had thought that certain things were going to happen, it would be a certain type of story, a certain type of tone, then I would have been, you know, it would have been something else entirely. And I, I didn't know that. I really enjoy seeing movies not knowing very much at all about them. Um, there's more opportunities to do that at home. Um, with, 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 not only with films and DVDs or with TV episodes as well. If you're watching a series, or if I'm watching a series, for example, I won't look at the clip package at the end of each episode to say, here's what's happening next week on blah 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 I'll just watch the next episode and take each thing as it happens, because I like being surprised, I like being uh, given the information about what's happening in the story as the people that are directing and editing and writing the episodes want uh, rather than getting bits of information early in the marketing and maybe spoiling surprises or what have you. In this case, there's no real plot to spoil, but there was a lot of things that happened in the movie that took me by surprise, and I was delighted. I was delighted by, by how this movie played out. Um, and I guess that means that I have no taste, and I'm not smart, <laughs> for spotting the very, very obvious biblical symbolism. Um, and, uh, yeah, but you know what? I'm not going to... Uh, I wouldn't give up the experience of seeing this movie because, like I said, it was the kind of experience where I walk out going, wow, that was amazing, film was amazing, I haven't been this excited about seeing a movie in the theater in, like, seven years, you know, not since Inception I've been walked out on such a high, on such a, a elated mood, um, just by having seen something so incredibly different and, and daring, um, <clears throat> the daring Daronofsky, right, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, um, Mike also mentioned a couple of bits of very, very violent business uh, in the movie, and yeah, yeah, it's it, it, it gets very, very rough in a couple of scenes, um, but, you know, I've seen so much uh, bloody business uh, in the movies and um, other stuff that I've seen over the years, it, it doesn't bother me in the slightest. You know, I'm taking in the story, I'm not bothered by any one particular element um, of, of, of content, um, that's, uh, <clears throat> that a movie has. The only exception, I think, is maybe bathroom scenes. <clears throat> I've never understood why they have to show people going to the bathroom. Um, you know, sometimes it's done for comic effect, but, uh, I figured, you know, they could just set that scene somewhere else. It doesn't have to be in the bathroom. Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, any kind of violence or, or things like that, you know, I've seen it all. I've seen so many different foreign, non-American movies that have way more extreme violence uh, than, um, than what's typically seen in something like this, and yeah, yeah, I'm sure it bothers a lot of people, and just the movie itself bothers a lot of people, because it gets to the point, I guess, where people are expecting a thriller that has some sort of, um, uh, dramatic conclusion to it, some sort of conventional conclusion, uh, and you're not getting that with this movie, or, you, you know, there's no chance you're getting it with this movie. <clears throat> um, but yeah, quite an experience, and not only the experience of seeing and enjoying the film and, and just being amazed by the discovery of, of, of what this of what it has, um, what, what it's doing, but also amazed that so many other people uh, who've seen it felt differently about it, 
who just went, this is a big bag of BS, as, as Jim would say, or that it's pretentious, or that it's a, you know, a, a, a personal project on too grand of a scale, or, or something like that. You know, you know, I, I, there, there are certain movies that I don't like that a lot of other people do. The one that comes to mind is X-Men Days of Future Past. That's, but I, I dislike that movie for different reasons. There's so many things that happen in that movie that don't make sense, that just fly in the face of um, basic logic, <laughs> even of a, of a time travel movie with people with superpowers. It's just like there, there has to be some sort of logical th things that happen, and, and that movie just abandons and I'm not going to get into that. Anyway, um, yeah, so for the past couple of weeks, I've been thinking a lot about this movie and reading about it, and watching people's reactions, and there have been a few positive reviews, but most of them have been negative. Most of them have been, you know, why was this movie made? <laughs> why are they encouraging people to go see it by putting, you know, such a big marketing push behind it, you know, and everything? Why does Darren Aronofsky torture his characters or torture the women in his films or, or something like that? I don't know. Um, I, I, I took it as, as it was, and... Um, you know, I don't, I uh, don't like to think that I'm shallow, but I guess I just maybe don't want to think too deeply about certain things. I don't know, but uh, but yeah, I really sort of wondered whether or not I uh, ought to be continuing to talk about movies on YouTube because <laughs> I really seem to be in the minority on this one. Um, yeah, right now it's on my list of movies that I enjoyed most this year. It's right at the top. It is number one, and it might not stay there because there's more movies to come out. Uh, during the course of the year. Just for context, the other couple of movies that I really enjoyed this year were Silence by Martin Scorsese, which is a pretty rough movie to get through, uh, and 20th Century Women uh, with Annette Bening, which if you didn't like <laughs> Mother, if you don't like violent movies or rough movies, then 20th Century Women is definitely a movie that you will enjoy more because it's it's a really good drama and has lots of really interesting characters in it. Anyway, um, so... Uh, can't think of anything else to say on the subject right now. I'm still kind of eager to revisit a lot of Aronofsky's films. Um, just, you know, to like start with Pi and just go all the way through and watch each of them in, in turn, including Mother, one more time. I'm eager to see this movie a second time. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, that's all I've got to say in the movie the subject, uh, 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 at, the, at, the, at the moment. So uh, thanks very much for watching. Hopefully uh, it was interesting to you. Um, and I'll uh, catch you again real soon.